My name is Matt Cudmore. I'm the founder of Meyer Skis. I uh, started Meyer Skis out of Glenwood Springs, Colorado. Our factory is now downtown Denver. Currently, I'm living up here in North Idaho with my family. We're hanging out in my R&D shop, which is Sandpoint, Idaho, just at the base of Schweitzer Mountain, where we're skiing today. My neighbor asked me if I wanted to try to build a pair of skis. At the time, I've got three little kids uh, and a newborn, and that's kind of the last thing I'm thinking about. And uh, my grandma had just passed away and gave each of us kids $1,000 wanted to put it towards something special and unique. So I put that towards uh, my first ski press and uh, a welder and uh, got after it. It was a very exciting thing to create my first pair of skis with my own two hands and, and have the kids see me do that. Building the first pair, first few pairs, uh, I was just using the materials that I could. The skis were great, uh, but people were saying, well, why would I buy your skis if, if I could buy someone else's? There's so many different brands out there. So I really got to thinking and we had to make, do something special with it. And we were having a barbecue and my brother was over and uh, he said, well, how cool would it be to, to build skis out of a, uh, the timber sale I got going on right now? So I started trying to figure out like the best woods locally to use. Everybody in Colorado knows about the pine beetle kills that are chewing up all the trees and killing them off. So we decided to, to try to incorporate those into the skis as well, which is a hard thing to do. The skis now are about 80% Colorado Aspen and 20% Pine Beetle Kill, all locally harvested. The, just the mixture of that has, has come out with a, a really great combination for a very poppy, lightweight, responsive ski core. All my friends started skiing on skis and their friends started skiing on the skis, you know, so my orders were getting bigger every season and at the beginning, the direction was keep it local, keep it small, build 50 pairs of skis for the locals every year or something like that. And I quickly learned that the locals can only buy so many pairs of skis before you have to get out, outside of that market area. It was all that success and people loving what I was creating and everybody just saying, you should do this. You should quit your job and do this full time. So my business partner came on and the first thing that we were needing to do was to move out of my garage and, uh, and get into a real factory. At that point, Matt was still in the garage. He's probably doing 20, 30 skis a year. But uh, um, I thought that he was onto something that was truly unique and different. And that's not easy to do in an industry like the ski industry where skis have been made for many, many years by brands that are mostly European based. We felt like we could take what he'd done in the garage and turn them into something bigger where we can add some resources. So that's when we set up in the spring of 2012, set up a factory out in Glenwood Springs. So I quit my job, a lot of risk, but I was still able to provide for the, for the family. Yeah, so my wife, Rosie, she is an awesome, awesome lady. In fact, the name, Meyer, came from her maiden name, which is Meyer Grohlman. So she's been behind me from, from day one and my biggest supporter. Building a business from scratch, especially a manufacturing business where you're not producing a five or $20 widget, but you're producing skis that you know, you're trying to sell at a price point from 600 to $1,000 is, is no easy task. And frankly, it's probably uh, was a much greater hurdle than Matt realized, and a much greater hurdle than I realized. But you know, once you've kind of uh, you're in deep and committed, you want to see it through. And it's taken significantly more hours. It's taken significantly more money. It's taken significantly more risk for both of us. I would say both personally and financially to get it to where we are. And. Uh, hope that you're able to somehow push that heavy wagon up over the hill and you know Mara Skis is right right at that point right now. Still a lot of hurdles to get over. Uh, we're still not cash flow positive but that looks promising for this year. Either it's gonna uh, fall fast and crash or hopefully it, it catches flight and uh, you know soars and uh, right now it's feeling a little bit more like uh, a more positive outcome uh, than not. Yeah, out of this 
this little space here uh, that we've put together, we think we can be the largest ski brand that actually makes their own product uh, here in North America, which frankly just doesn't really happen in the ski industry. So we're kind of hoping to break the mold and bust through. Meyer's been a wild ride, but it could all end right now. And I could, would consider myself the most successful guy out there because one day I was playing with my kids. We were riding BMX and his bike broke. And he said, Dad, Dad, hold up. We need to jump in the car and go to the shop. And I'm like, why? Well, my bike broke. I need to go build another one. And he grew up knowing that you build something. And that is by far the biggest accomplishment is showing, showing my kids that you can work hard and it pays off and you can accomplish anything you want to and you can build something. Meyer Skis is an example of how a business gets built. Someone has an idea or sees a problem and comes up with a solution. Sometimes it's in the form of a charity or nonprofit, but more often than not, it takes the form of a company. Take, for example, two friends. Let's call them Joe and Tom. They have an idea for a new product and want to start a business. They talk it over with their families and decide to pursue their dream. They pool together their savings, take some money from their retirement funds, and come up with $50,000 to start working on their idea. They put together a business plan and convince two investors in town, Bill and Deborah, to invest another $50,000. With $100,000 in the bank, Joe and Tom rent some space on 2nd Street, buy some machinery, and start making backpacks. The first year is all about setup and finding some customers willing to try their product. In year two, they sell nearly 1,000 units and are able to hire two employees and start growing. Years three, four, and five see steady increases in sales, and Joe and Tom are able to hire more employees. The company's cash flow is still negative, they are still spending more than they make, but revenue is increasing. They take small salaries for themselves so they can invest what's left into the business, but they are enjoying the work and beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel. In year six, Joe and Tom saw a big opportunity to grow. So they took a loan from the local bank to buy more equipment and hire eight new people. Their risk paid off and sales more than tripled. Over the next four years, the business grows as to the costs. There is still no positive cash flow, and Joe and Tom are still getting paid less than their employees. Things are tight at home. Luckily, they have understanding families willing to forego vacations and house remodeling projects. The investors, Deborah and Bill, are anxious about their money. Over the next several years, Joe, Tom, and their team work hard, and by year 10, the company has 30 employees and is finally making some real money. They paid off the bank loan, and were able to distribute a small return to themselves and their investors. Finally, in year 15, after five more years of hard work and breakthroughs, the company has over 100 employees and is becoming a recognized innovator in the industry. Joe and Tom and Bill and Deborah all made several million dollars in return on their original investments. Of course, this simple story leaves a lot out. Real companies are messy, and four out of seven new businesses fail. And not everyone makes it big like Joe and Tom. Yet all companies start small and require entrepreneurs and investors willing to take risks to accomplish their dreams. There is rarely such a thing as an overnight success. We can focus on the monetary success of entrepreneurs and investors like Joe, Tom, Bill, and Deborah. We can wonder why Joe and Tom made so much more than their employees. But just as economics is more than math, business is about much more than money. First, a business only makes money if it provides goods and services that people want and need. And perhaps most important, yet often forgotten, entrepreneurs and investors help create social cohesion by bearing risk. For over a decade and a half, as Joe and Tom's business was not only selling products and paying salaries, it was playing an essential role in the community by creating stability and opportunity. For years, while Joe and Tom had many sleepless nights, worrying whether their risk would pay off, 
Their employees had stable incomes, were able to buy homes, pay for their children's education, participate in the local community, and donate to their churches and other civic groups. The creation of business is not a solitary activity, but a series of personal, social, political, and cultural relationships. In the next episodes, we'll see how small businesses contribute to their local communities and the common good just by being a business. We'll also see how they interact with others in a global network of cooperation, competition, and exchange. <laughs>